Come on and Oakwood, go ahead, stand and join us as we sing praise. We worship the God who was, we worship the God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors, he parted the raging seas, my God, he holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet, we shout out your praise, there's joy. Sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung up on that cross, then he rose up from that grave. My God still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Redeemed by His grace, let the house of the Lord sing praise. We were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Today, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. What a great crowd out there. I love it. Why don't you guys go ahead and have a seat? We'll get to some announcements. Uh, great time to be a Michigan fan. Great time to be a Detroit fan, I hope. We'll see what happens today. All right, guys. All right. Our important announcements today, besides football, are join the crowds during the Milan Fall Festival. That's going to be Thursday, September 28th through Saturday, September 30th. That's right at the Milan American Legion. Thursday, September 28th, we'll have DC and the Pilgrims performing and a special, special, spe I'll spit it out, special message from our one and only Pastor Frank. So he'll be there speaking. For more information and tickets are available at www.mylanfallfestival.com. All right, guys, we're doing 101 today. It's going to be at 3 o'clock till 630 
uh, pizzas uh, uh, provided. If you still want to do that, even though it's today, you can still sign up. We can still sign up, right, Mike? So still sign up, go to the web or app for that. Uh, we need to make sure who's coming, but we got a few more spots open. We had enough pizza coming. So make sure if you have not taken 101 and you'd still like to do that, please do that. If you've ever wondered what comes after 101, can you guess? 102. I thought it was, I heard a 301. It's 201, yeah. Yeah, 201. Uh, if you were wondering what comes up, it's 201, yep. Our OBC 201 course, that's going to be on Sunday, October 8th, from 3 o'clock till 7.30. Uh, in OBC 201, you will earn or, or learn the tips and tricks to grow your faith and maturity as a Christian. Christian, make sure you sign up on the app or website for that. That's really important. Again, guys, if you have never taken these classes, if you're brand new here, we'd love to have you. If you've been here 10 years and you've missed some of those classes, and I guarantee there's some of you have, make sure you sign up for either one of those classes. And it's a great time. So ladies, join the women's ministry as they host a movie night at the Rumor Home on Friday, October 13th, beginning at 6.30. They're going to be watching the movie Sound of Freedom, great movie, with various snacks. So sign up on the website or app for that. Lots more stuff going on. Check out your notes, your bulletin, apps, the website. Uh, stand up, turn around, welcome somebody to Oakwood, and let's get back to some awesome worship music. sin and shame well they were like prisons we couldn't escape but he came and he died and he rose those walls are rubble now remember those giants we called death and grave well they were like my that stood in our way but he came and he died and he rose those giants are dead now for this is our God this is who he is he loves us this is our God this is what he does he saves us he bore the cross beat the grave Fear that took our breath away. Pain so weak that we could barely pray. But he heard every word, every whisper. And now those altars in the wilderness, yeah, they tell the story.
is our God, this is what he does, he saves us. He bore the cross, beat the grave, that heaven and earth proclaim, this is our God, King Jesus. He bore the cross, bore the cross, beat the grave, that heaven and earth proclaim, this is our God. Firstborn of creation, he is the first, the last, the one who matters most. He is creator, ruling sustainer of all, he holds it all together. He is the word of God, the whole.
magnify you your name will be exalted exalted lord exalted all exalted with the angels exalted exalted
and go before him. Dear Lord, we just stand here today, God, and we have so much to be thankful for. We are thankful, God, that when we see that cross, we are reminded of the sacrifice that you've made. We are reminded of the freedom that we have. God, I pray that you would just allow us to remember those words, to remember the cross, God. It's not just something that we celebrate at Easter. Your sacrifice, God, is not just something that we celebrate once a year. It's every single day, God, because we have life because of you. We are thankful because of you, God. We have a purpose because of you. I pray that you would just bless our pastor as he comes forth. Open our hearts, prepare us for the message today, God, as he continues the sermon series about hurting and healing, God. We love you so much, and we do all of these things in your holy and most precious name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. This is the part of our service where our ushers come forward and take the offering. If you are joining with us online, we have Saturday services at 5 p.m. and Sunday morning services at 11.15 a.m. We'd love to get to know you and grow with you and see you right here in corporate worship as our God commands. And we'd love to just be able to meet you right here. If you're sick, stay away. <laughs> but if you're feeling good. But as I ask every single week to the viewers and listeners online and the people sitting in this room, our God is good. Amen. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> I am not preaching this morning. <clears throat> I appreciate those uh, sentiments. But I did want to take a minute uh, before Pastor Frank came up today, because uh, God just has been prompting me the whole time this morning to come and read Psalm 51 to you. This started... I don't know how many of you got to see Joe's post uh, this morning, uh, but it touched my heart. And I suspect that there are others in this room that have messed up already this morning too. Satan's biggest lie is to pretend to be the Holy Spirit and to condemn you. This morning, let's take just a few seconds, bow your heads and ask God this. 
Father, if there's anything between you and me, please tell me right now. If he shares anything with you, just confess it. Agree with the Holy Spirit and ask for forgiveness. If he doesn't prompt you with anything, don't dream something up. Just take the fact that you and God are good at the moment. If you're finished, go ahead and look up and listen. If you're not, take the time that you need to get right between you and the Holy Spirit. David screwed up big time, several times, but one time in particular, stealing the wife of another man who served in his army, getting caught, and then deciding that he was going to have that man killed so he could have that man's wife as his. Big sin. Big, big, big sin. God sent the prophet Nathan to confront the king. David had the right heart. The heart that the Bible says was a heart like God's own heart. Psalm 51 was the song that David wrote about his experience. Listen Listen to these words. Pray these words if you need to this morning. Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love. Because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin. For I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. Against you and you alone have I sinned. I've done evil in your sight, and you will be proved right in what you say, and your judgment against me is just. For I was born a sinner, yes, from the moment my mother conceived me, but you desire honesty, listen to that word, but you desire honesty from the womb, teaching me wisdom even there. Purify me from my sins, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Oh, give me back my joy again. You have broken me. Now, let me rejoice. Don't keep looking at my sins. Remove the stain of my guilt. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence and don't take the Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. Then I will teach your ways to rebels and they will return to you. Forgive me for shedding blood, O God who saves. Then I will joyfully sing of your forgiveness. Unseal my lips, O God, that my mouth may praise you. You do not desire a sacrifice, or I would offer one. You do not want a birth offering. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O oh God. Look with favor on Zion and help her. Rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will be pleased with sacrifices offered in the right spirit, with burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will again be sacrificed on your altar. Remember Psalm 51. And in those moments when you know you've really blown it, pray those words to God. I hope that you'll get things settled, even in these quiet moments as Pastor Frank comes, so that your spirit can be willing and able to hear what he has to teach us today. Every single time I do a, a, a series on a certain subject, individuals take it, go through the thing, and go, okay, I'm looking at the words, I see where it's, it's going to go. Sometimes it goes in a different direction. That makes sense to everybody? Do you believe God actually can speak to you? Okay, cool. Sometimes he doesn't say what you want him to say. Sometimes you're sitting there going, okay, God, i got to deal with this issue. Wounded and weary, I'm hurting, I'm struggling. My life is in pain in a certain area, and I really would like to see it changed. 
So you automatically start searching for advice. What do I, I do? <clears throat> Any of you in this room ever struggled with weight? Having to lose weight? You ever been there? Gone through that battle? You, know, you, you, you can stop. It's kind of easy. And you can go, mm, okay, I look in the mirror and I look overweight. Okay, I might need to do something about this. But do you do something about it? Doctor looks at you and says, you're struggling with diabetes. This is where you need to change. You need to do this or you need to do that. Do you? Or do you complain like crazy at God because he gave you diabetes because it couldn't have possibly been your fault, correct? Hmm. So what I'm going to do today is sitting down and saying, you going, I'm wounded, I'm hurting, I'm tired, I'm struggling. So the advice I'm going to give you, there's going to be a few individuals that go, oh, I, I, I don't get that. That's that you're not telling me the thing that would fix it the way I think it should be fixed. Okay, so let's have fun. Start in the verse that's there. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. Dear friends, he qualifies it. Hi, talking to you. Dear friends, you always followed my instructions when I was with you. And now that I am away, it's even more important. Work hard to show the results of your salvation. How many of you in this room have raised children? How many of you know when you're around and your children are there, they obey and they do things because you're standing there? How many of you know that the instant you leave your house, things don't always happen like you think they do? Any of you have children that have gotten older in life? College age, older than that? Did you ever leave them in the house for a long period of time and you come home and you can't understand how that one hole got in the wall that's there now? And they tell you a story of how it happened. And then... Years later, when they're all in their 20s and 30s, they tell you the real story of what happened? Yeah. And all of my children sitting here right now are going, <clears throat> shh. So Paul's looking at them and going, hi, when I was there, you obeyed me and you listened because I was standing there. Now I'm gone. <clears throat> it's even more important that you deal with the things you need to. So work hard to show the results of your salvation. Do the things you're supposed to do to show you're saved. Same message it was in James. Do what you're supposed to do to show you know Christ. Healing, changing, fixing being wounded, fixing being weary is not done through whining. It's not done through complaining. It's not done through, my life just sucks. It's done through sitting down and saying, I have to do some things to make some things different in my life or it will never happen. But we tend to be individuals that if it's out of sight, it's out of mind. So keeping something in front of us becomes really important and it's how God has to deal with us. Tony Campalo wrote a book called You Can Make a Difference. He told a story in there that was profound. He said two individuals were traveling together, two men one day. They had left Victoria Station in London. They were sitting in a seat in the train that they were traveling in, and there was a gentleman sitting right across from them. Twenty minutes into the trip, the one gentleman started having an epileptic seizure, fell out of his seat, was shaking all over the ground. The other gentleman got out of the seat genderly, slowly, pulled his jacket off, turned his head, adjusted his tongue, put the jacket under his head, pulled out a cloth, started wiping the perspiration off of his head, and started talking to him quietly. Within a few moments, the seizure was over. He gently helped him get back into his seat. He set him down. He sat beside him. They sat there for a while, and he looked up at the individual in the seat that was looking directly at them and said, please forgive us. He said this happens to him two or three times a day. He said, you see, both of us were in Vietnam. He said, we were walking through a field when snipers nailed both of us. He said, I was shot in both legs. He took a round in his shoulder. He said, we immediately called to get a helicopter to come in to airlift us, and they couldn't get to us. He said, he picked me up, and for three and a half days being sniped at regularly by the Viet Cong, he walked me out of that jungle. He said, I begged him for three and a half days because, believe it or not, I was in way less pain than he was. And he said, I begged him to set me down and let me die. He said, he said to me, you know how they kill 
individuals when they find them. They like to take their bayonets and just slowly run them through your body. He said again, for three and a half days, he walked me out of that jungle. He said, four years ago, I found out from a friend that he had epilepsy. He said, I sold my house in New York and moved here to England to take care of him because there isn't anything that I wouldn't do for that man. How many of you agree with me that that's a touching story? Raise your hand. You go, that's a touching story. Got it. No problem. Agree. The problem, the individual that he took out of Vietnam and saved his life, and the individual that has epilepsy are both going to die. In fact, if I remember correctly, one of them is dead now, but they're both going to die. I think that certain stories that we tell are really important that this person did this because of this thing that was inside of them. <clears throat> if I remember correctly on dates and times, um, the individual after Vietnam um, lived about another 40-something years, if I remember correctly, um, maybe 50, but anyway, um, is, is now dead and gone. So from when life was saved in that jungle to when he died, that many years went by. Let's just use the number 50. So 50 years went by. Um, how many of you are born-again believers? You've asked Christ into your life. Say amen. amen. How many of you know for sure you're going to heaven? Amen. How long does heaven last? 50 years in heaven. Please remember this day, this time, in this service, walk up to me in heaven and go, do you remember when you said this? Because if scripture's true and if God is real and all of that is laid in stone, that means there will be a day in heaven that you guys will be dancing around, talking and laughing with each other and someone will stop and go, do you know what yesterday was? No, what was yesterday? We've been here for one million years. Technical question. 50 years in life compared to one million years is nothing. Would you agree? So there will be a day in heaven you'll go, oh my goodness gracious, do you know we've been here 10 million years? And it will just keep going on. Now, because you're a human being living in this world where time is, you know, this, you know, finite little thing, you go, I can't even wrap my head around a million years. So because of that, we take time and we turn it into something that it's not, and we sit down and we <clears throat> on <clears throat> this little <clears throat> of time and we make it important. I'll prove it to you. How many of you in this room already ate breakfast? Just raise your hand. A few of you will go, my, my arm's getting tired. That's, you're lazy. This is your workout, okay? Ready? How many of you ate breakfast already? Okay, how many of you in this service are ever going to eat lunch? How many of you ate breakfast yesterday? Lunch yesterday? Dinner yesterday? Raise your hand. You ate dinner yesterday. Don't, don't get confused. Yes, it's a question. Ate dinner, raise your hand. Okay. Now, some of you call it supper. So if you're confused, how many of you ate supper? How many of you had a midnight snack? Raise your hand, midnight snack. How many of you had two midnight snacks? Mm, okay. <clears throat> okay. So everybody, just so we're all on the same page, and you're going to go, you're weird. Yes, I know that. I don't have a problem with that. Everyone, everyone who ate dinner or supper yesterday, raise your hand. How many of you had a prayer time yesterday? Raise your hand. Not, Lord, bless this food. Let it nourish my body. <laughs> prayer time yesterday. Okay, question. Why do we as human beings, <clears throat> we, 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 we would... We would die. We get up in the morning. What's for breakfast? It's lunchtime. Time to eat. Some of you skip dinner, but you have four snacks before the evening is over. And you would, you, you would, it would freak your little brain out. Sorry, no disrespect. It would freak your little brain out if you didn't get to eat. What is it with us? And yet, me saying, did you pray... There's some of you that, well, you know, my, 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 my prayer life's not, 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 not that good. Why is it that we will center on eating, but we won't center on 
There's this feeling that won't go away inside of me. I can't get rid of it. It's there. It's bugging me. There's something that's stirring inside of me. And, 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 and I don't do, I'm a Christian. I know Christ. He is my Lord and he is my Savior and he is my King. And he wants to have conversation with me. And so I'm supposed to pray. We would, we would freak out of our minds if our schedule got crazy and we didn't get to have breakfast and lunch and dinner at the times that we do plus our snacks. It would, it would, it would literally freak us out. But skipping... Prayer, we don't think anything about it. Therefore, I have to ask a technical question. The technical question goes like this. Have you ever thought there just might be a chance that you believe that what's going on here right now is real? And this is not? And you go, oh, no, no, I would, I, I would never think that. Have you ever noticed you live and do what you believe versus you don't live and don't do what you don't believe? You would die missing a meal. You would die not drinking enough liquid. Some of you would die if you didn't get your coffee. Amen? I'm part of that crowd. But we can go through the whole day and not pray. And not go, something's really weird with this picture. So he looked at them and said, life is important down to the point that an individual would say, it's so important to me and I believe it's so real and it's so profound that this man saved my life on a battlefield and I will serve him for the rest of my days because I can't get past the gratitude of how I feel. And yet your Jesus died on a cross for your sins and paid the penalty for you so you didn't have to and you will spend eternity in heaven that is forever. But we will live like this meal is really real and important, and I have to do this or I'm going to get the shakes. But spending time in prayer, reading my Bible, oh, it, 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 I can go through the day without it. It isn't going to kill me. I'm asking you then a technical question. Which one is real? Is that real or is this real? And don't dare go, well, I have to eat to survive. No, you don't. You can live for days on not eating. You can't live for days without praying. Something will happen in your spiritual life that begins to unravel. No, you can't become lost again. But you become dormant in the faith. And then you struggle with why I'm not growing. Or why I can't heal. Or why things don't change. That's why the writer said, work hard to show the results of your salvation. Obeying God with deep reverence and fear. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Do everything without complaining and arguing. How many of you, that's your favorite verse in the Bible? Do everything without complaining and arguing so that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. The question automatically comes up if we're going to look at our life and say, God, how do you change things? How do you do it? Number one, by submitting to God. By just sitting down and saying, I'm going to do what you want. Again, everyone that's raised kids, say amen. amen. You do realize that the way the world teaches us to raise children today doesn't work? Everybody got that? That's why we have college full of kids called cupcakes. You guy have a bunny wabbit or a kitty cat to pet or they can't get to school and they have to have snacks? We've lost the ability to go, hey, life sucks, buck up. Things aren't easy, they're hard. No one's just going to give you a cushy job. You have to work for certain things. Oh, they're just emotionally troubling for me. Hmm. What happened is when that child was being raised up, no one ever broke their will. No one ever sat down and said, because psychology today teaches, oh, no, we need to enhance the will. We need to grow the will. We need to make them involve into it. No, you need to break their will. You need to sit down and look at your child and go, hey, I love you. <laughs> Snap. You go, that's not love. What are you raising? A cupcake will spend the rest of their days having to hold onto your trousers so they can survive? Or an adult that has the ability to deal with what's going on? So when I say submitting to God, it's taking me and saying, I'm going to deal with the part of Frank that wants what Frank wants. And I'm going to look at God and say, Father, what you want is important because you know all, and I believe that, so I'm going to live for you. 
Therefore, again, the verse, what I'm getting at, friends, another version of it, what I'm getting at, friends, is that you should simply keep doing what you've done from the beginning. When I was living among you, you lived in responsive obedience. I love that term. Responsive obedience. I was there. I was in your face. I said it. You did it. Now that I'm separated from you, keep it up. In fact, double your efforts. Push more. The accountability is not there. I'm not standing in your face anymore. You're supposed to grow as a Christian. You're supposed to be changing. He kept me out of hell. He changed my life. He saved my family. I'm supposed to look at him and say, I owe you. You have done this great thing in my life. I will serve you. 1 John 2, 5-6 through 6 says, But those who obey God's word truly show how completely they love him. That is how we know we're living in him. Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. Any problem with that? You heard what Pastor Ron stood up here and read to you? He came to me and said, this is what God's laid on my heart. I said, go for it. Why? Because our first duty in life is not to figure out our freedom. It's to figure out who our master is. Peter Forsyth said that. He said, the first duty of every soul is to find out not its freedom, but its master. I love you. You've tried everything under the sun. The hurt is still there. The pain is still there. Please look today and go, oh, someone's saying something that might push me in a different direction to help me. So the first thing is, is I submit to God. That means I stop and say, you're in charge, I'm not. The second thing that we do, number two, we do that with dread and trembling. You go, that doesn't sound like a real exciting relationship. He said, and now just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Paul again with the people of Colossae. He said, just like you got saved, now follow him in faith. Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. I love gardening. I understand fertilizing, pruning, pulling weeds. I understand roots go down. I understand what's got to take place. Oh, that means as a Christian, I'm supposed to do the same thing. I'm supposed to set myself up to grow. Colossians 2, the last part says, Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught, and you will overflow with thankfulness. Please take the verse and dissect it the way you're supposed to dissect it. You read it. Just like you accepted Christ, walk in faith, let your roots grow down. Then these things, oh, then that word, then these things will take place in your life. That means for me to follow God, to be what I'm supposed to be, just like I got saved, I'm supposed to follow him, and as I follow him, certain things happen. You do know what stubbornness is in the Christian life, right? Did you come to church today? How many of you, your wife had to beat you up to get you here? The single guy is going, not me. Why are you here? Oh, I didn't have anything better to do. Why are you here? What is really going on that you're sitting in this building? Why are you here? Well, we start to, oh, well, I'm here to learn about God. I'm here to change some things. Pastor Ron read something that was really profound. Respectfully, I don't mean this. I'm not being rude. Just hear me. What book did he read out of? What chapter? Do you know I know all kind of people that when the service is over and they get in the parking lot, they couldn't answer that question to save their life? I have given tests to church before. I spend all morning long preaching. People have come back for, remember we used to have Sunday evening services? Okay, people would come back for a Sunday evening service. I give them a little card and say, what did I talk about this morning? And you're not allowed to look at your notes. In one service, 300 people, only three of them remembered what I said. You go, oh, please. I'm sorry, that's that's the way it is. You go, okay. I'm here. What are you trying to do to me? How many of you remember Roger Staubach? Everyone who knows Roger Staubach, raise your hand. Cool. Quarterback for who? Do you remember when he won the world championship? You remember what year that was? You're not a football fan if you don't know this. 1971. You know what the big, inter- can you believe we, when we use the number 71, that was 50 something years ago? But that'll help you feel old. Because you remember Roger Staubach? Who was coach? Tom Landry. Landry. Okay, in our world that we live in today, 
the big quarterbacks that are the awesome quarterbacks, they call their own plays on the football field. You don't have discussions with reporters of, what do you mean you're not calling the plays? In 71, before they won the world title, there was a big fight with all the reporters with him and his coach. Because they looked at Roger Stallback, that was a phenomenal quarterback, and they said, wait, 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 wait. We've heard you don't call your own plays. We've heard that every play comes from the bench that the coach calls it. Well, what they didn't know when they touched on that, that they were bringing up a sensitivity issue in Stallback. And basically what he looked at all of them and said was, we fought, we warred, we battled. He is a football genius. But I wanted to call my own plays. And he wouldn't let me. And so we were constantly, please don't miss this, we were constantly in turmoil with each other until I, Roger Stallback, made a decision that I would be obedient to my coach. And the instant I became obedient, we started winning like crazy. And we now stand on the cusp of winning the world championship. And the issue, when they talked to Tom Landry about it, he, said, he was a football genius. They just sat down and said, what's the issue? Tom said, it's my team. I call the plays. I love you. Do any of you have a struggle with authority? There's a few of you right now are going, oh, not me. You're talking to my husband. Hmm. Stallback said, I changed everything about the game when I did that. How many times have I as a pastor been looked at by someone and said, I know what I need to do to fix the issue that I'm struggling with, but Roger Stallback knew the issue that he needed to do with the coach to fix it. He needed to be quiet and be obedient and accept the plays, even if he didn't agree with every single play that was being called. That's why Philippians 2.12 says in this version, work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear, you went, whoa, whoa, pastor, you said dread and trembling. Yeah, it's because I read the Greek, and if you take the Greek, reverence and fear to an American audience says certain words. In the Greek, what it really means is, is dread and trembling. It means me sitting down with a holy God and looking at that holy God and saying, I understand the magnitude of who you are, the power of what's there. That's why I asked the question in the service, hi, is the food real or the prayer real? Well, I've seen the food. Yeah, I get it. Have you seen the prayer? How many of you have ever seen God in action when he does things? Mind-boggling? So I'm asking you, and I'm, and I'm being sincere when I say this to you, do you believe in holy God? Say amen if you do. Amen. It's a Baptist church. We're allowed to say Amen. So now we'll do a test. You ready? Do you believe in a holy God? Amen. Do you believe in eating? Amen. Well, if you of you are very staunch Baptists, the answer to this should be automatic. Amen? You go, oh, this is the same joke we told the Presbyterian church. Oh, okay, cool. Do you believe in eating? Do you believe in prayer? And why the snot don't we do it? Why can we go through a day and blow this off? You wouldn't dream of going through a day and blowing this off. Am I correct? You'd die of a stroke. Some of you, if you don't, some of you right now, it's getting to the time that your body's starting to go. And you'll get out of here and you as a woman will look at your husband and go, hi, I'm hangry. And he just knows, go to McDonald's, wherever it is, just get a fry, stick it in her mouth, she'll be okay. Bite me. But you've never heard your wife get in the car and go, we need to pray. We need to stop right now and pray. Why? I don't know. Something in my spirit says pray. You've never been in a fight like that. Your husband's never looked at you and said, we have to pray right this moment. But you have come unraveled because they messed your pizza up in your order. 
Now, that's cold, but you understand what I'm saying? So when I say he said we're supposed to come to him and that there is supposed to be dread and trembling and there's supposed to be trepidation, that's hard on us. Oswald Chambers said this, and it fits profoundly. He said, the remarkable thing about God is that when you fear God, you fear nothing else. Whereas if you do not fear God, you fear everything else. If you want that explained, my lovely wife, where's she at? Where's Robin? Wave at me. Hello, hello. Oh, she's back here causing trouble. Hi, gorgeous. We have a little joke that we do with each other all the time. I call it, welcome to my bubble, right, dear? And it drives her nuts. Hi, so I'll ask you so you can understand my bubble. How many of you believe with all of your heart that God is in charge of your life? Amen. Hmm. So when I tell her, welcome to my bubble, hi, nothing can happen to me unless he says it's going to happen. Nothing. Nothing. So when I say welcome to my bubble, respectfully, she knows because she's lived with me all these years. It's why I'm not afraid of anything. You go, okay, make it, make it, make it. You got to be something. There's something you're afraid of. Yeah, there is one or two women on the planet. It's just about it. Maria, where's Maria? Hello, Maria. And I'm afraid if anyone else cuts my hair, right? Those are my great fears in life. Nothing else. You go, wait, wait. No, you're kidding. Excuse me. If you truly believe that God is real, if you truly believe that God is really in charge of your life, what the snot do you have to be afraid of? He's king. He's God, which means I'm one of God's kids. So where I walk, he takes care of me and he watches over me. And everything that hits me goes through his hands. If it goes through his hands, then if it's harder and hurts worse than anything I can think about, it already went through his hands. And he said, son, I love you. But this hell that you're going through right now, I have chosen for this hell to walk through your life. Therefore, you're my God and you're my king and the hell that I'm walking through is ordained by you and allowed by you and used by you to mold me and make me even though it hurts. But he's God. Something happens in my life. God doesn't go, well, gee whiz, that surprises me. <laughs> Did one of you angels let this happen? Dad gum fire the boy that did that. No, it, God looks at me and says, Frank, what you're going through right now, I planned. I want this to happen. This is going to mold you. This is good. That's why I stand and look at my wife and go, hi, welcome to my bubble. There's no fear in my life. Why is there no fear? And you can ask every friend I've got. You can ask my wife. I, 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 I live the nutty edge of insanity. You guys like to go into buildings. That, how many of you have ever been to the Sears Tower? You have to walk into the Sears Tower, walk right over the glass and lean over and watch the... Some of you right now, I almost wet myself when you said lean over. <laughs> Some of you walk into a plane. As you're walking up the steps of the plane, your insides start going... <laughs> and you sit in your seat and hold your arms. Have you ever thought through the process that holding onto the seat as hard as you can doesn't do anything? <laughs> you ever see and study people that have been in car wrecks? Why is it the drunk always lives? Because he's relaxed. Cars smashing into other. This is the drunk. Hey, cool, man. <laughs> You're in the other vehicle going. Which means everything that flies through the vehicle hits you like a buzzsaw. So the greatest lesson you can learn in life is relax. I'm following Jesus. You go, I'm sorry, in a head-on collision, I'm not going to be going, relax, I'm following Jesus. <laughs> Wouldn't it be really cool the pilot says, sorry, we're going down. Sorry for the pilots that are in the room. We're going down. We're all going to die. Goodbye. 600 miles an hour. <laughs> Wouldn't it be really cool that you can stand in heaven and go, yeah, I could barely get out of my sea. And about 50 things before we hit the ground, I flew through the air, pinned against the back wall. And while I was on the back wall, I yelled at everybody, if you were to die right now, do you know where you'll spend eternity? Pray the prayer fast. 
Oh, no, no, no. You're going to die in the plane going, ah! And then you get to stand in heaven and listen to people forever going, you looked like an idiot while you were dying. <laughs> you wet yourself. Couldn't you have used the last... Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you understand what I'm saying? That's why I walk into yards with a great big dog and, he, and I look at the dog and go, in the name of Jesus, shut up and sit down. You go, what if he bites you? Then he's not a born-again believer. <laughs> and after he bites me, he's going to hell, so I'm not worried about it. You go, you're being humorous. I'm asking you a question. Do you believe this or do you believe that? Because the problem with healing and being what God wants us to be is we miss the thought that if I'm afraid of him, I don't fear anything else. If I fear everything else, it's because I really don't fear him. So the next step for me is through his power. He said in Ephesians, I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. That he will grow you, that he will push you, that he will change you. I pray that that power will be there. But if you allow me, hey guys, that has to be as important than that. And just like you are hooked up to that and connected to that, you have to be hooked up to this and connected to this and not giving it lip service. It's not, oh, God bless his food. It's not, ooh, Lord, we're having a rough day, help us. It's you sit down on a daily basis and say, Father, this is my time where I come before you and spend my time talking to you. I connect. Young missionary on his first missionary trip to Singapore was taking the place of another missionary. He was showing him around, and he walked in, and he said, this is the apartment where you and your wife will be staying. This is the furniture. It'll be left. You'll be able to use it. Walked around and told him a few more things about stores and stuff, and they walked outside and said, and this is the car that you will be driving. <clears throat> I am sorry to tell you this, but the car that you're going to be driving has a problem. It will not start. So I have worked out a deal with the school across the street, and every morning they come out laughing because a whole group of kids push me down the road until it starts. But you'll get that figured out. So the next day he went out, car wouldn't start, went to the school, got the principal, principal died laughing, the kids came across, pushed him down the road, way he went. He was there for two years. During the two years he got it figured out that the greatest thing he could do is every time he went someplace was park the car on a hill so it would roll down the hill or leave the vehicle running. He was only there two years because his wife got sick. And so he said it was a little weird. He found himself standing there now doing the opposite of what had been done to him as he walked the new missionary around, was showing him all the stuff, talking about everything. They stepped outside. They looked at the car. As they're looking at the car and talking about the car, he looked at him and said, it won't start. Ba -da 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 -da. Went through the exact same spill. And then he started trying to explain to him about the stores. While he was talking, the guy walked over and opened the hood. Do you know where this story is going? He opened the hood. When he opened the hood, while he was talking, he looked up at him and said, Hey, you think there's any chance the problem might be the loose wire going to the battery cable? He tightened it up, got in the vehicle, and started it. The kick was, the missionary that had been there did that for two years, and the guy before him did it for six. Eight years of push-starting a vehicle when the whole issue was the cable was not properly connected. I'm going to ask a technical question, you answer the truth. How many of you, your first feeling inside would have been to check the wire? Raise your hand. You're a wire checker. How many of you would have just pushed the car for the next whatever years you were there? So you realize when I go, this is real, food, versus this is real, If God is truly real, if he's truly there, then I as his son need to look at him and say, God, I need to trust you. I need to live for you. Because you and your word said some things that were profound. You said in this verse, God is working in me, giving me the desire and the power to do what pleases him. To sit down and say, this is real, it's profound, it's part of my life. He's empowering me to do that. Why I have to deal with that? Matthew chapter 11, verse 12 says a verse that's a little crazy for some people. 
It says, and from the time John the Baptist began preaching until now, that now was them, but it's now us, he said, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing and violent people are attacking it. If you want to know what that verse means, it just simply means, hi, in your faith, when you came to Jesus and you asked Jesus into your heart, you did not pull up to a luxury cruiser and get on a ship that was going to be a joyride. You walked into a world of being on a battleship and you have an enemy and he hates your guts. And if right now when I said that, if something twinges inside of your head that goes, oh, there we go with all of that demon stuff. How many of you guys understand what a creed is? A lot of you were raised in church, and a creed was super important. Steve Turner, an English journalist many years ago, wrote a creed for the world that we live in now. Please listen. Why this is important, please listen, is because every single day of your life from the time you were a little person to a big person, our culture has been doing its best to indoctrinate you. Why do you think, and just so you'll know how I feel about it, so it's clear. Why do you think there's so many weirdos out there that want to make it where your little second and third grader has access to books in their library that are perverted, demented, vulgar, and nasty beyond thought? Why do you think they want your little second and third grader reading those books? So they can raise up the next group of perverts so that they can live in their world of nasty, vulgar dementedness and have buddies to deal with. And if when I say that, there's something inside of you that goes, oh my goodness gracious, you just mixed politics with your sermon. Yes, I did. And I will do it again. I love his creed. We believe in Marx, Freud, and Darwin. We believe everything is okay, as long as you don't hurt anyone. To the best of your definition of hurt, and to the best of your knowledge... We believe in sex before, during, and after marriage. We believe in the therapy of sin. We believe that adultery is fun. We believe that sodomy is okay. We believe that taboos are taboos. We believe that everything's getting better despite the evidence to the contrary. The evidence must be investigated, but you can prove anything with evidence. We believe there's something in horoscopes, UFOs, and bent spoons. Jesus was a good man just like Buddha, Muhammad, and ourselves. He was a good moral teacher, although we think his good morals were bad. We believe that all religions are basically the same, at least the one we read. They all believe in love and goodness. They only differ on matters of creation, sin, heaven, hell, God, salvation. We believe that after death comes nothing, because when you ask dead people, they say nothing. If death is not the end, if dead people lied to us, then it's compulsory that we all get to go to heaven, except maybe Hitler, Stalin, and Genghis Khan. We believe in Masters and Johnson. If you don't know who they were, they were dysfunctional sex therapists, so just so you understand. We believe in Masters and Johnson. What's selected is average. What's average is normal. What's normal is good. We believe in total disarmament. We believe that there's a direct link between warfare and bloodshed. Americans should beat their guns into tractors, and the Russians would surely follow. We believe that man is essentially good. His only problem is, is his behavior. This is the fault of society. Society is full of conditions. Conditions are the fault of society. We believe that each man must find the truth that's right for him. Reality will adapt accordingly. The universe will readjust. History will alter. We believe that there is no absolute truth, except the truth that there is no absolute truth. Therefore, we believe in the rejection of creeds. You've been taught this all your life. This has been pushed on you forever. And if you want proof of it, do any of you have the same issue that I do? I don't like going to beaches anymore because people have forgotten how to wear clothes. Any of you struggle with that? Someone in here will go, oh my goodness, you are a prude. Uh, no, no, I just cover my body. You wouldn't appreciate it if I showed up in a thong to preach in, Amen. Thank you. <laughs> a few of you right now are going. <laughs> a 
But why is it okay that we live one way in one place and another in another, and our culture just rolls with that and doesn't think anything about it? And if you dare get up and say something's wrong with this, people struggle with you. Why? Because there are no absolutes. And to sit down in this culture and say there is a God, but that God is not a little fuzzy creature running around. He is a God that looks at me and says, Frank, I want you to submit your life to me. And I am king, and I am Lord, and I created you. So that leads to number four that I have to deal with. It's by trusting him. Everybody ready? And that's why it says, do everything without complaining and arguing. Please look up at me. Welcome to my bubble. It means I have to look at God and I have to say, I trust you with everything inside of me. So when something doesn't go the way I want it to go, complaining is me saying, I know what's better for me than you do. Bernard Brown, president of the regional health group in Georgia, was visiting a hospital checking out some things one day. A patient knocked over a cup of water while he was standing there. He was afraid someone might slip, so he looked at a nurse's aide and said, would you please clean that up? He said, it looked like I had just offended everything inside of her as she looked at me and explained to me that the nurse's aides clean up small spills and the large spills are for the hospital housekeeping group. How many of you have the ability to look at a spill and determine whether it's a small scale, spill or a big spill? Why don't we live in a world anymore where we just go, I'll, I'll, I'll get that. Why do we live in a world of we get radically offended when someone looks at us and asks us to do something that just might be out of our market and pay grade? Why don't we have an ability to look at each other anymore and say, I will serve you, I will help you, I will deal with you, and I will do all this stuff. Oh, no, because that's not what I'm supposed to do. And then, therefore, we spend all of our time not trusting God. There's some of you spend hours, I'm sorry, this will kill a few of you. There's some of you that spend hours researching everything you can to live to be 100. I live in the United States of America. I don't know if I want to live to be 100. Heaven gets more pleasing every day. Anyone agree? I know Biden won't be in charge and I won't have to pay taxes. Amen? But we jump on everything. How many of you love eating? How many of you worry about what's in the food that you're going to eat? How many of you eat it anyway? I know individuals are like, oh, I'm sorry, I can't eat a tomato. It's a shade plant and it's bringing damage to my body. I love you. You're already damaged. I'll prove it to you. Do you know it has been reported that pickles cause cancer, wars, communism, airline tragedies, auto accidents, and crime waves? How many of you, without me reading the facts, go amen? Okay, sorry. Proof. 99.9% .9 of cancer victims have eaten pickles sometime in their life. So have 100% of all soldiers, 96.8% of all communist sympathizers, and 997 of everyone involved in an air accident or a car accident has had a pickle in their life. The biggest proof, biggest proof, you ready? Moreover, those born in 1839 who ate pickles are all dead. <laughs> Everyone who agrees, say amen. amen. How many of you will never eat another pickle in your life? Losers. <laughs> they also discovered that if rats eat 20 pounds of pickles a day for a month, they end up with bulging abdomens and they lose their appetite. I figure if it's bad for a rat, it's bad for me. Why is it when I read that evidence, do you not stirringly go, oh, I will never eat another pickle again for the rest of my days? You go, well, the evidence is true and the evidence is real, but the evidence is bull. Oh, so everyone that believes in God, say amen. amen. Can God do the things in your life that we have been talking about today to help you? If you trust him, if you sit down and say, 
This area of my life, I don't get. I don't understand. But because you're my holy daddy, I know that before it hits me, it goes through your hands. And you will not do something in my life that destroys me unless it's time for me to go home. My problem with it's time for me to go home is I would much rather choose how I leave this world. In bed, watching a football game, or sleeping. You go, you didn't say prayer. I had already prayed before that happened, okay? Do you understand what I'm saying? The technical question on this service and this weekend is, do you really believe? If you really believe he is who he says he is, then all the struggle you're struggling with over healing and, and getting yourself adjusted and getting where you are, it's not an issue of the anxiety. The problem with anxiety is I don't trust my Savior. I can't control what's inside of me. Oh, that sounds really cute. How many of you in this room talk to yourself? How many of you talk to yourself? A few of you right now are going, oh, that sounds really weird. But you talk to yourself all the time. So when the enemy attacks me, I talk back. You're a loser. You're dang right I'm a loser. Thank God Jesus died for losers. Everyone who's glad that God died for losers, say amen. amen. So say it back. You're just dumb. Yeah, I know. The enemy's standing there going, and you're like, no, I'm dumb. Agree. Everybody who says I'm dumb, say amen. amen. I, I was talking about you, not me when I said I'm dumb. <laughs> the Bible says agree with your adversary quickly. So when he speaks and he says, this is what's going on, that's what's going on, it's going on for this and it's going on for that, the Bible says agree with him. Okay, yeah, you're right. What, is, what, what does that get you? You're still going to hell and I'm not. So instead of talking to yourself, talk to the idiot that's attacking you that wants you talking to yourself. And say to God, God, I trust you. I don't care what he says, I trust you. You want the best for me. Even if what I'm looking at right now looks really insane and it looks really hard, I still trust you. Oh, and you want me to do one more thing that drives me nuts. You want me to be a great example. I want you to do all this. No grumping, no complaining, no fighting. I want you to do this so no one can criticize you. I want you to live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. Did you get that verse? Did you get it? You know what it says in the original Greek? It says, so that none will be criticized. Live a life that's above reproach, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and democratic people. <laughs> Some of you right now are going, I'm a Democrat. Live with it. You, go, you went political again. No, you're supposed to be an example. That means if I said something in a sermon that annoys the living daylights out of you, why did God have me say it? Well, it just says you're a jerk. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the fact that you're supposed to grow and you're supposed to change and you're not supposed to come to church so you get your brownie point that says, I went to church. You're supposed to be able to look at God and say, Father, I am here for a reason and you are doing something profound in my life. And as you do something profound in my life, people are looking at me and people are paying attention to me and people are watching me. That's why James Baldwin said, children have never been very good at listening to their elders. Everyone who's raised kids and agrees with that, would you please say amen? amen? They have never been good at listening to your rules and the people that are above them, but they have never failed to imitate you. Little David was two years old when they walked him into a room at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. He sat in front of one of the greatest cancer research specialists in America. And in front of his mommy, John Truman, Dr. John Truman, looked into little David's face at two and said, son, you have a 50-50 chance of surviving this leukemia. Mommy went to pieces. 
He said the chance of cure is going to involve trips to the doctors, blood tests, intravenous drugs, all kind of test things. And little buddy, it's going to be way worse on mama than it's going to be on you. He was talking to the child, but he was speaking to mom. When he was four years old, they took him into the doctor to have a spinal tap done. Some of you in this room have been through spinal taps. The doctor looked at him and said, Davy, this is going to hurt you, but I think it'll help you get better. Three nurses, all three men, held that little body to the table. Mama died listening to him scream in pain. Halfway through the process, little David was soaked in sweat, tears rolling down his face, and they paused for half a second. And when they paused, he looked up into the doctor's face, gasped for breath at Dr. Truman, and said, Dr. Truman, thank you for my hurting. How many of us trust our God enough to say thank you for my hurting? Because, see, we go to church because we want to hear the preacher get up and say, God loves you and you're precious and you're nice little boys and girls because Joel Osteen said. <laughs> nope. You're wonderful and you're precious and you're awesome and God does some things in your life that you judge as, whoa! But there's other times in your life that God does things that you judge as, whoa. When do we stop and say, Father, I understand the job promotion. I understand the great husband or wife. I understand the wonderful kids. I understand this vacation. I understand all these great things you've done. But this hell that you've walked into our life, I don't get it. It's me stopping to say, do I trust? which then leads into the fact that he said you're to be a good example. And the kick about being a good example is everyone's watching you. Your little people, your friends, your family, your church, they watch how you struggle. That's why Benjamin Franklin said a good example is the best sermon. So as I close, would you bow your head and close your eyes with me? May I ask you a question that I feel is really important? You've probably heard a thousand preachers in your life ask you, do you really believe? I'm asking today. Do you really believe there is a God? That he died for your sins? That he wants you to walk in faith and follow him? And that he's there? and that he's real. And if you believe that, then you as his child have access to his throne to come before your savior. And he actually hears you. So right where you're sitting, he put you here today for a reason. It wasn't an accident. Tell him, right where you're sitting, tell him, I love you, I believe in you, and I trust you. And that situation that's eating up my head right now, I trust you with it. Father, use me. That's your words to him. Father, use me. Grow me, mold me, make me. But Father, in all of that, teach me to trust you with what's going on in my life so that I might be a good example and give you glory. We ask this in your name, Lord. Amen. See
to be in the arms of our Savior. Turn around, tell somebody how much you love them. Go be the church. Go Lions. Shout to the Lord. 